started. Uh, good morning, everyone. I believe that this may be the 31st annual Oppenheimer Ginsburg lecture because the first one was way back in 1987. And it was Sidney Trulove, world famous Sidney Trulove, was the very first Oppenheimer Ginsburg lecture. So before I introduce uh, this morning's lecture, I do want to um, it's sort of like the reading of the Twas the Night Before Christmas on Christmas. This is what I read to you every year that we have this lecture so that people are reminded of who Oppenheimer and Ginsburg really were as people. And here they are. I think I finally, um, after eight years here, finally have identified them correctly. They're, I've had prior years where Ginsburg was Oppenheimer and vice versa, but this is correct to my knowledge. So first of all, Gordon Oppenheimer, the tall guy, was born in New York City in 1900. Um, he got his bachelor in medical degrees from Columbia, and then he did a two-year internship here at Mount Sinai Hospital and completed that in 1924. And then during uh, the Second World War, he was uh, second in command of the General Surgical Service at Mount Sinai Hospital. Um, he also served uh, in his lifetime on the staffs of Bronx Hospital, Gouverneur Hospital, Sydenham Hospital, and Mount Sinai Hospital, of course. Um, he became the director of the Department of Urology at Mount Sinai in 1947, and he did this until 1963. And then in 1971, after he left the pra private practice of urology, uh, he became chief of the VA regional office outpatient urology clinic, and he did this until 1974. Um, while he made many outstanding contributions to medicine and medical literature, his most outstanding one probably was his work on regional enteritis. And Dr. Oppenheimer was a member of the original team that uh, delineated this important condition. And in fact, it was Dr. Oppenheimer who worked in the laboratory and did the pathological description of the disease. He published 69 separate contributions to the medical literature, and these range from many urological subjects as well as basic science work and his work on regional enteritis. And then the gentleman on the right uh, is Leon Ginsberg, who was also born in New York City um, in 1898. And he had his degrees also from Columbia. Um, he served on the house staff here at Mount Sinai Hospital and became an adjunct surgeon in 1926. And in 1937, Dr. Ginsburg became an associate surgeon at Mount Sinai, and he remained on the hospital staff here throughout his career. In 1940, he became the surgical director of the Harlem Hospital. And in 1942, he joined the staff of the third general hospital, the U.S. Army unit affiliated with Mount Sinai. He served in North Africa and Europe and eventually reached the rank of major. And in 1947, he was appointed director of surgery at Beth Israel Hospital in Manhattan, where he served until 1967. As an adjunct surgeon at Mount Sinai, Dr. Ginsburg served under the eminent surgeon, Dr. A. A. Berg, who charged him and his colleague, Dr. Oppenheimer, with reviewing surgical specimens in the pathology laboratory. Ginsburg and Oppenheimer developed a, an interest in diseases of bowel, and they began a project to describe and categorize their specimens of bowel tumors and strictures. Of the 52 specimens they examined, 12 didn't fit any previously described pattern, and at Dr. Berg's insistence, um, Ginsburg and Oppenheimer shared their research in a draft paper with Dr. Burl B. Crone, who was an internist who had been collaborating with Dr. Berg on the treatment of two patients with similar symptoms. Dr. Crone made additions to the paper and presented it to the May 13, 1932 meeting of the gastroenterology section of the AMA. The paper was later published in the October 15, 1932 issue of JAMA. As Dr. Berg declined to be listed as a co-author on the paper, um, it was published under the alphabetically listed names of Crone, Ginsburg, and Oppenheimer. Dr. Ginsburg, in the meantime, had presented a paper on his and Oppenheimer's findings to the AGA on May 2nd, 1932, which was uh, a number of days before Dr. Cron had presented it. The paper was eventually published in the 1932 transactions of the AGA under the title Nonspecific Gran Granuloma of the Intestines, and in expanded form in the 1933 December issue of Annals of Surgery. And these papers introduced the diagnosis of terminal ileitis, which was later revised to regional ileitis and eventually to regional enteritis. And then, of course, later it was understood colon could be involved. And, however, due to Dr. Crone's activities in presenting the diagnosis to a wide audience, 
of physicians and the fact that his name was common was first on the paper. Crohn's disease became the eponymous um, disease name by which most people now call it, although, um, as historians will recognize, um, the condition was described in Scotland, in Poland, and a number of other places, even before Crohn, Oppenheimer, and Gins Ginsburg and Oppenheimer described it. So today, with this lecture, which was endowed by uh, the families of Oppenheimer and Ginsburg uh, more than 30 years ago, um, we remember these men who jokingly referred to themselves as Et and Al. <laughs> um, but we remember them here, even if the rest of the world doesn't quite remember them. And uh, this lectureship has really attracted uh, the very best people. Um, it, it is, um, re in recent years at least, it has been people from North America who have had a distinguished career in the inflammatory bowel diseases. And so over the years, we've had um, Henry Janowitz himself, Ted Bayless, uh, my mentor, Daniel Podolsky, the late great Lloyd Mayer, of course, Steve Hanauer, Steph Targan, uh, Dan Present, Bill Tremaine, Jim Lewis, David Rubin, Church Bernstein, Jeff Hyams, Adam Chaffetz, uh, Balfour Sarter, and now, today, Dermot McGovern. And so, Dermot, um, we're very thrilled to have you here today. And just a few words about you and your career. Uh, he's a man of the world. Um, parents are uh, British and Irish, uh, one, one and another. And uh, he had his medical degree from St. Mary's Medical School at Imperial College, University of London, and Doctor of Philosophy uh, from Oxford, where his work was done with Derek Jewell, the eminent IBD um, geneticist, um, everything, really a foundational person in, in the world of IBD. And from the very beginning, uh, Dermot's interests have been in the genetics of IBD, and that's where he has continued to make his uh, world-renowned reputation. Um, he is a member of the Royal College of Physicians in London and uh, is a part of numerous international collaborations. In 2007, he went to Cedar sinai where he's the Director of Translational Medicine for the F. Jaja Foundation, Inflammatory Bowel and Immunobiological Research Institute there. Um, hope I got all that correct. Yeah, and I've been studying. And uh, he's a professor of medicine at Cedar sinai and UCLA. He's also uh, the Joshua and Lisa Greer Endowed Professor of IBD Genetics there. Um, he's been a member of the NIDDK's IBD Genetics Consortium and is also a member of the International IBD Genetics Consortium, member of SHARE, the Sinai Helmsley Alliance for Research Excellence, the CCFA Microbiome Initiative, the Human Microbiome Project 2, very early onset IBD consortium, and he's an advisory board member for the Helmsley Foundation. He has more than 130 original papers to his name, um, much of it in the realm of genetics and also the relationship between genotype and phenotype and outcomes, um, and has had numerous honors in the field. He's a member of IOIBD, and also uh, elected to the American Society of Clinical Investigation. So we're absolutely thrilled that Dermot has uh, dragged himself across the country and what would be very early on the West Coast is going to be delivering this year's Oppenheimer Ginsburg Lecture um, on 1932 regional ileitis and all that. And we can't wait to hear what the all that is. So Dermot, thanks very much. So thank you very much for the very kind words of introduction and actually for the invitation. It's, it's a real pleasure and a privilege to be here. Um, not only to give this lecture, but it was amazing to hear that Sydney True Love gave the first one. <laughs> so I, I, since Derek was Sydney's academic son and I'm Derek's academic son, I regard Sydney as my academic grandfather. So it's some nice symmetry there. Um, so when people say, when I say to people I'm from Cedar sinai they say, well, where's that? Because there is no place that is Cedar sinai It's not like Mount Sinai, there's a Mount Sinai. And um, the reason that it's Cedar sinai is that there used to be a Mount Sinai hospital in L.A. and a Cedars of Lebanon hospital, and they merged, hence the Cedar sinai 
So I do come to you from another Mount Sinai of sorts um, to bring another symmetry into that. So um, obviously we heard a little bit about this landmark paper. And um, uh, what I thought that I would do is go back to this paper and actually pull out what I think are some very seminal points that were made in the paper and just see where we've gone over the last uh, 80 years or so since this paper. Um, the first thing I noticed is the language in this paper is incredible. The, way, the, the, the clinical description of what we recognize now as being terminal ileal Crohn's disease is just incredible. And some of the, the words, I had to go back to my um, dictionary a number of times just going through it. Um, and so, you know, we truly are people probably divided by a common language, uh, as people have said. But I certainly learned some English from this, if nothing else. <laughs> So a couple of things really jumped out at me, and I put the original text from the paper here, but also just summarized on this side what I th the points that I wanted to make. So the disease was described as being of unknown cause in young adults and restricted to the terminal ileum, and, and very, very um, definitive about that restriction to the terminal ileum, which I, th which I have always found very fascinating. So we still don't know what causes Crohn's disease. And, um, you know, these, this, is, this is a slide that everyone's seen a variation of in every presentation about what causes Crohn's disease. And, of course, this is the, um, the trifecta of um, microbiome, environmental factors, and host factors, including genetic susceptibility. And as you heard, my, my real interest has been in, uh, on the genetic side, but I'm interested in the relationship between the genetic and the environment. It's, it's tough to look at those things, um, you know, individually. I think uh, we need to be a little bit more creative about it. So I'm going to talk a lot about around the genetics. So we, we've made amazing progress in identifying the genes associated with inflammatory bowel disease. And it says at the top of here that IBD has enjoyed unparalleled success. And that's because we had more genes than anyone else until very, very recently where hypertension has overtaken us. They now have something like 500 genes, but they needed half a million people to identify those genes. <laughs> that was just the authors. But, uh, um, <laughs> but we now have more than 200 genes in IBD, largely discovered in European ancestry populations, and we're trying to catch up with some of the other populations. Um, this was the first gene for... Um, Crohn's disease, or for IBD, but specifically for Crohn's disease, uh, that was discovered. And I put this up. Um, Judy isn't here, but really just to acknowledge Judy Cho's amazing contribution uh, to this field. But also, if we're really talking about terminal allele disease, this is the gene, certainly in the European ancestry population, which has the biggest effect. And of course, this sparked a whole um, uh, uh, sort of area of research and so on. More recently, We've been interested in trying to identify associations between genotype and subphenotypes, which go, which again goes back to the description of uh, in, in the seminal paper. And in the international consortium, what we discovered in a very large study that we published in the Lancet a couple of years now ago is that in Crohn's disease, over time the disease behaviour changes. That's nothing new. We've known about that for a while. The other thing that we observed is that the disease location seems to remain constant. Um, and so that, I think, is a very important finding. And when we look, try to look at the known IBD loci associated with subphenotypes, we only found three that were, first of all, MST1, which was associated with younger onset, that was the phenotype, the MHC, which is associated with colonic disease, and NOD2, which is associated with small bowel disease. Actually, we knew about the MHC and the NOD2 before this, so this wasn't anything new uh, in this paper, which was a little disappointing. So, so what we were talking about before was that perhaps the, the disease that um, um, was described in this paper was a NOD2 disease, and the colonic Crohn's disease was an HLA disease. But the HLA is incredibly complicated. And what I'm showing you here are the HLA associations um, across, across the HLA. So these are all the different alleles. 
And what you see up here is the um, odds ratio. And in red, it's ulcerative colitis. And in blue, it's Crohn's disease. And you can see that the HLA has an effect in Crohn's disease. And here is the biggest effect. This is the HLA here. This is the HLA DRBO103. But you can also see that there are other um, alleles where the association is in the opposite direction for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, which is a slightly bizarre phenomenon, not something that we would have predicted. But what it seems to be related to is disease location, which again goes back to this um, important observation uh, that we're talking about. And so if you look at the HLA DRVO103 uh, locus, the association is really dependent on disease location in Crohn's disease. So we have a very significant association with ulcerative colitis, around three to four. Um, for, for Crohn's disease, it's more modest, but it actually depends where the disease is. And for colonic Crohn's disease, the effect size is bigger than in ulcerative colitis. And we see an inverse sort of relationship with one of the other alleles, one of the other alleles that goes in the opposite direction. So it's complicated. I think we can draw a conclusion from that. So with the IBD genome, we have, um, as I said, more than 200 loci. One interesting phenomenon that we found is that the, there is a very significant overlap in terms of the genes for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. In fact, the majority are shared between the two conditions with the effect in the same direction, not like I showed before with the um, HLA. But even though the genes are shared, they have different size effects depending on the disease. And what I'm showing you at the bottom here is something called a Belgravia plot. And basically, what I've highlighted here is the IL-23 receptor. This is Crohn's disease. This is ulcerative colitis. The IL-23 receptor is a gene for both. But you can see that the effect size is bigger for the IL-23 receptor in Crohn's disease than it is in ulcerative colitis. So what this allows us to do is start to create risk scores, polygenic risk scores. So what you do for any individual is you take the number of risk alleles that they carry, and then you, and then you put in a weighting factor for the effect size, as I've shown here. And you can create a polygenic risk score for any individual. So we all have a polygenic risk score. It's just that people without Crohn's disease have a lower one than people with Crohn's disease. And I'll show you some data around that later on. But the point about this was, once you create these polygenic risk scores, you can apply them to different phenotypes. And here, I show you the polygenic risk score, and that's determined by disease location. And what it actually shows is that ileal Crohn's disease is a significant way from ulcerative colitis. And in fact, colonic Crohn's disease is this intermediate phenotype and is probably closer to ulcerative colitis than it is to ileal Crohn's disease. Again, Going back to the paper that they were describing, they were describing this disease over here at, and not this disease. And so there's definitely some def uh, differences in the genetics there. The other phenotype that we've been interested in is late onset disease. And this is work that's in press at inflammatory bowel disease, um, work done by uh, Daylin Lee in my group. And essentially what he did is he created the polygenic risk score and then looked at age of onset. And if you ignore this young onset, because we know that very early onset um, disease may have its own peculiarities, and you, and you look at what he's called middle-aged disease, which is uh, a term I didn't like too much, I have to say, um, but also then looked at people who developed disease over the age of 55, they had very significantly lower polygenic risk score for Crohn's disease than people who developed the disease uh, up. So I'll just go back a second to um, at, at 50. So the, the cutoff was actually 52 years. And they have a very different clinical phenotype, and I've shown you here. And the biggest difference really is in the prevalence of colonic disease. It's 40% versus 20%. Uh, and the elderly also have some differences in terms of decreased risk of surgery. There are some serological differences that I've shown you there, and also a lower rate of uh, being smokers as well which is very interesting. So these, just going back to the paper, the oldest patient they identified was 52 with this disease. As it happens, 52 is exactly that tipping point in that slide that I just showed you. I'm not making that up, I promise you, which is an amazing coincidence, or not. 
So Charles Wells, a few years later, described this segmental colitis and obviously had some discussion uh, with uh, Burrell Crone. And Burrell Crone said, this is not the same disease. You're describing a different disease, um, which is uh, very interesting, I think, that we now call that colonic Crohn's disease. So they also observed that this was a progressive disease and that the majority of people went on to a stenotic phase um, or stricturing disease. And we've known about this for a long time. This is another picture that is in every single discuss, a talk you'll see about Crohn's disease. This is the study from um, Paris showing progression of disease um, over time in Crohn's disease. And this is the data from the International Consortium from that Lancet paper that I was talking about. So disease does progress. And are we beginning to understand some of the um, factors that are associated with that? So we know that in our clinic, when we evaluate patients, there are certain factors that we'll talk about and, and try and evaluate to see whether they're more likely to have severe disease, if we're going to think about maybe in introducing biological therapies early or not. But what about some of the molecular things? Well, there's also been some progress there. So this was published last year. This is a study from the UK where they actually looked at extremes of phenotypes. And you can see the definitions of their um, for poor prognosis Crohn's disease and good prognosis Crohn's disease. And they took their whole Crohn's disease data set and looked at the extreme phenotypes. So they actually ended up analyzing 50, about 50% 50 of their uh, patients. And what they're able to find is four different loci which are associated with poor prognosis. And I've listed the genes here. The, the top one there, the X-ACT, is a, a, a long coding, um, long non-coding RNA, which is, people don't know what it does, but it's highly expressed in the intestine. The MHC is actually an ancient haplotype, which is associated with uh, poor response to vaccines. Um, and, and, and so obviously has some immunological function. FOXO3 is in the TGF beta pathway. And they've previously shown that this has been uh, a susceptibility SNP to uh, tuberculosis and uh, severity of malaria but with an opposite association to the one that, that they see in inflammatory bowel disease. And then IGF-BP1 uh, is uh, related to insulin growth factors and is also associated with more severe uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So across the immune diseases, you're seeing markers that uh, identify people with more severe disease. They didn't see any difference with the polygenic risk scores that I was just talking about. Um, <laughs> that their gene uh, expression profile showed that the genes that were most associated with poor prognosis were, were found in stimulated um, monocyte-derived uh, macrophages. There have been some other work looking at prognosis. This is um, a really nice study from Oxford, uh, which was a collaboration with Janssen, where they identified that this uh, oncostatin M um, was associated with more se severe disease. They started with inflamed mucosa uh, taken at colonoscopy, and showed that high expression, there was high expression of both oncostatin M and its receptor, and that this um, correlated closely with histo histological severity and the need for surgery. And they did some nice functional work to suggest that this was relevant from a, from a functional point of view, not, and not just a, a, a bystander. Um, but most importantly, they, did a, they found a network that was associated with this, which was associated with non-response to anti-TNF. And so people have started to think about this as a marker of non-response to anti-TNF. The problem is we don't know whether this is just a marker of severity or truly a, a, um, a, a network which identifies non-response. My suspicion is it's a severity marker. And the reason I say that is that work that's been done by uh, Alka Potdar in my group, where she's taken um, unaffected small bowel, so she's taken samples from the resection margin of people who've had surgery for Crohn's disease, no histological inflammation, done some transcriptomics, and identified that there are three clusters in the transcriptomic uh, uh, group. Cluster three, compared to cluster one, has more severe disease, shorter time to recurrence, actually bizarrely has a higher prevalence of perianal uh, fistulizing disease. We don't fully understand how a small bowel signature can tell us that. But some of the genes that drive this include that oncostatin M receptor. So I think, again, this is a really a marker of severity. Um, and I know people are looking at oncostatin as a, to see whether it's also associated with non-response to some of our other therapies.
No, they were colonic. colonic. Yeah, yeah. Take, take a colonic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is, um, um, it troubles me to say it, but a very, very nice study from Cambridge in the UK um, <laughs> where they, they looked at gene expression in CDA positive T cells in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And again, they looked at the transcriptic pro profile and were able to identify two groups which they labeled as IV1 and 2. And in both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, this transcriptomic signature was associated with more severe disease. And actually, Marla, I'm sorry to say, outperformed serology in Crohn's <laughs> disease. Um, this, I mean, this is fascinating. The, the reason I think this is particularly interesting is that they did the signature completely in inflammatory bowel disease. But when they looked at this, this um, original approach came from lupus. And when they looked at the lupus signature for more severe lupus, it actually was virtually identical to the one that predicted more severe disease and inflammatory bowel disease. So again, identifying things across different diseases, uh, which may help us in inflammatory bowel disease. And the way they think about using this is using um, you know, sort of Bayesian approaches. So if you have a pretest probability of um, about 40% of your patient with ulcerative colitis having severe disease, you have a positive test, it takes your post-test probability to around the order of 80%. In contrast, if you have a negative test, it takes that post-test probability down to 15%. So this can be very, very useful clinically. They have a problem, though. You can't have a test that's run in a lab where you're having to extract CD8 positive T cells and, and, and run transcriptomics and so on. That's just not going to fly. So actually, they went on and have done something very smart, I think. They basically tried to work out if they can just do um, a PCR assay in, in whole blood. And actually, they were able to do that. They validated their, sign uh, their signature uh, in an independent cohort just using uh, PCR on whole blood, uh, which I think is, makes it much more amenable to everyday use. And I'm really pleased to say they've now just started this study where they're actually going to take patients with Crohn's disease, do the biomarker assessment, stratify them um, based on the signature, and then stratify them again based on top-down and, and, and accelerated step-up therapy. So we're actually, hopefully, walking the walk, going to have a biomarker. So this will be fascinating to see. We're doing the serologies to check that they're OK. <laughs> okay perfect. Yeah, talking of serologies. So I can't come from CEDARS and not talk about serologies. And I couldn't be in a room with Marla and not talk about serologies. Um, Marla and I are good friends. And I want it to remain that way. So, <laughs> so these are the serological markers that um, many people you know, in this room will be aware of. These are the ones that, that we we run at CEDARS, but there are variations on this. Uh, I don't want to say that these are the only ones out there. Um, and this is Mahler's work, which has showed essentially that the more of these serological markers that you carry, the more likely you to have severe disease. And in fact, every study that's looked at this has shown this, essentially. There have been criticisms around this in that a lot of the data is cross-sectional and so on. But um, again, Mahler's study with a, with a prospective cohort uh, confirmed uh, the, the potential use of this. Uh, and, and of course, some people use this uh, routinely in their clinical practice, other people don't, and um, it remains controversial. You know, I think this was a fascinating study where you, um, uh, people led by jean frederic Colombel were able to access um, serum samples from the military um, and able to identify that well before people developed their Crohn's disease, these markers were beginning to become positive. And not only were they becoming, beginning to become positive, but they subsequently predicted disease behavior uh, in these individuals. So I think this, this may be one of many ways, um, and there's, I know there's a real interest at Mount Sinai about this, in identifying people at high risk of disease. Can we intervene much earlier in terms of uh, when they have pre-disease? So there's lots of omics and things moving here. So I think one of the studies that's really tried to bring this together is the, is the, is the study around the risk cohort. This is an inception pediatric cohort, um, about 900 subjects at diagnosis uh, who were all said to have V1 type disease, inflammatory disease, and were followed prospectively. And basically looking for factors associated with uh, developing complicated disease. And various analyses were done. 
Um, the stricturing behavior was associated with uh, being positive for one of those serologies. This is an anti-flagellin serology. Penetrating behavior was associated with uh, age of diagnosis, uh, being African-American, uh, uh, the anti-flagellin serology, and also ASCA. Also incorporated into the study, we're looking at the microbiome and looking at a gene signature uh, from uh, ileal biopsies. And the, when the gene signature was added into the uh, mix, the gene signature was the only thing associated with stricturing behavior. Penetrating behavior was still associated with uh, being positive for the anti-flagellin antibody. And when anti-TNF, early anti-TNF therapy was introduced, um, the pictures changed somewhat. One of the headlines that came out of this study was that stricturing behavior was not prevented by early anti-TNF therapy, whereas internal penetrating disease was. I think we need to be a little bit careful how we interpret that because this wasn't a clinical trial. Um, physicians were allowed to use the um, medications as they felt appropriate and so on. Um, and, and I believe that everyone who went into the study didn't necessarily have cross-sectional imaging uh, at the start of it. So the majority did, but we just have essentially needed. Yeah. So we just got funding to get all the discs of the MRs done at diagnosis. And, and you have much further follow-up now and, and more, more numbers who've done this. So I think this is a very, very important study, and I think additional things will continue to come out of it. Um, and here was the predictive model for, for complicated disease. So just going back to the seminal observations, um, interestingly, if you read the paper, the, the implication of the paper is that if you see perianal fistulizing disease, it's ulcerative colitis. Which is, which is very interesting the way that we think now. So they said not associated with perianal fistula. I've actually taken this data out, but when we looked at our, our cohort of 500 patients with perianal fistula with Crohn's disease, the prevalence of um, ileal disease was much, much lower than people um, who didn't have perianal disease. Um, so again, going back to the original paper, no evidence of tuberculosis. They hammer this home. And this is sort of, if you go to a conference in East Asia and, and, and in India, this is what you hear all the time about tuberculosis. So it's very interesting to see this uh, uh, in the original paper. And this tuberculosis thing is quite interesting. If we go back and look at the genetic loci that we've identified, there's very, there's huge overlap with a, a lot of other conditions. We sort of preloaded this because we were looking at, a, at genes that were associated with other immune-mediated diseases with the study. But there is a lot of overlap with a lot of things that we see that there's a higher prevalence in our IBD patients, like psoriasis, celiac disease, ankylosing spondylitis, and so on. But one of the things that really jumped out of the study was there's very significant overlap with mycobacterial disease genes, so leprosy, um, uh, Mendelian susceptibility to mycobacterial disease. So when I first saw this data, I was like, oh, no, here we go. This is the whole mycobacteria and Crohn's disease story again. We're, gonna, we, we're really going to struggle with this. But actually, um, what we were able to show in the publication, it's a little controversial um, how we did this, but is that what this data is suggesting is that these genes remain prevalent in our population because they may have protected us from these conditions in the past. And this is the downside now of uh, that sort of selection process. And the, where I think this is particularly fascinating um, is in the Ashkenazi Jewish population. So what I'm showing you here is some data um, that um, we've just actually heard has been accepted for publication. Uh, and there's a collaboration between uh, the Broad, Mount Sinai, and Cedar Sinai largely. And basically, we've done whole exome sequencing in a large number of Ashkenazi um, Jewish individuals, both uh, controls and Crohn's disease. And here, what you can see is the polygenic risk score in the Ashkenazi Jewish population in the controls. The polygenic risk score for Crohn's disease is higher than in the European non-Jewish population. So the Ashkenazi Jewish population is loaded with the genes for Crohn's disease. Uh, and also within Crohn's disease, they have a higher uh, prevalence as well. And 
when we go and look at what the differences are between the Ashkenazi Jewish population and the European non-Jewish population, we start to find that the Ashkenazi Jewish signature is th are these genes which are more related to intracellular bacterial response, whereas the European non-Jewish are these genes more responsive to fungi and the sort of the TH17 IL23 pathway. And Judy Cho always talks about this um, uh, historic data where in times of tuberculosis epidemics, Ashkenazi Jewish population are somewhat protect protected from developing tuberculosis. This may be the reason why. So from a sort of epidemiological genetic perspective and, and, and Darwinian type approach, I think this is fascinating. So um, the, the, the next point that I saw is there were no specific microscopic features except granulomas, of course. Um, there's a lot of talk about granulomas in this paper. And um, I think this is an area that's significantly under-researched in, in IBD, and, and there's real opportunity here. Um, and we've been fortunate enough to work with Thad Steppenbach at WashU, where we were looking at changes in panath cell morphology and able to identify genetic associations with the panath cell morphology. NOD2 and ATG16L1 are a couple of the genes that we've identified. Interestingly, we found an inverse relationship between panath cell abnormalities and the number of granulomas, um, uh, and we can't explain that. And, and again, that's an opportunity for research going forwards. Why is this important? If you have bad panath cells, you have more severe disease. Uh, we showed that in our um, uh, original paper published a few years ago now. We were very interested to try and work out what's happening in non-European populations because the genes we'd identified were NOD2 and ATG1601 and they don't have effects uh, as far as we know in East Asian populations. So we were able to collaborate with a, a former fellow of mine who's now back in Japan and we were able to show that Japanese patients with Crohn's disease also have bad panath cells. So it's not as high, the prevalence is not as high as European patients, but they're definitely there. If you have bad panath cells in Japan, you also have a worse prognosis from your Crohn's disease. So we've shown that in an independent group. There's no association with NOD2 because it's <coughs> monomorphic in that population. There's no association uh, with bad panath cells in HTC 16 l one but there is an association with this gene LARC2, which is another thing that feeds into this whole autophagy pathway. Uh, and so on, and is a susceptibility gene for Crohn's disease in the European population. And Inga Peter, part of it, and we've been fortunate enough to be part of this collaboration, has just published this paper showing that LARC2 gene is not only associated with Crohn's disease, but also with Parkinson's disease. And so here again, we have these pleiotropic effects um, from, from genes from IBD across different conditions uh, and real opportunity to, to learn from, from other areas. So, so we've taken this study a little bit further, and this data is not published yet. Um, and what we were able to show is that there, there is a gene-environment interaction here. So smoking adds to the panacell defect in people who carry this genetic variant, this ATG16L1. And if you pile smoking on top of um, the, the panacell defects, then people worse prognosis. And we were able to show that in mice. So you can smoke mice. I don't know whether you knew that, but you can smoke mice. And if you smoke them for two weeks, then um, they actually get bad panacells. cells. And then there's a washout period for about four weeks and their panacells cells start to return to normal, um, which is interesting. Uh, and when when we looked at the sort of transcriptomic profile associated with um, uh, some of these signatures that we were seeing, we saw some interesting things. Some of the pathways that were involved were related to apoptosis um, and others to metabolic diseases, and particularly of diseases driven by um, PPAR gamma. And what we were able to show, because there are PPAR gamma drugs out there, is that an agonist, one of the glitter zones, um, actually could help, in mice, could help recover panath cells. So you could actually treat these mice and sort of return them to a more sort of physiological normal uh, state. And, uh, and of course, there's been a lot of interest in PPR gamma 
um, in, in terms of response to bacteria uh, and also uh, in colitis. And there have been some studies in ulcerative colitis, but not in Crohn's disease. And if this is, mechanism is, is, is true, then this ident potentially identifies a subset of people with Crohn's disease who could respond to PPR gamma uh, uh, agonists. We'll see. Um, first of all, we need to get the paper published, uh, and then we'll try and move on with uh, thinking about um, doing a study there. But how does that, I mean, the ATGs or autophagy, yeah. you're talking about apoptosis, yeah. how do those two pathways? We don't, we don't fully understand that. So when we looked in the uh, autophagy defects related to this signature, we didn't see those. Interestingly, the other thing that could, um, uh, could <coughs> reverse this was if we used anti-TNF therapy. Um, and the anti-TNF therapy didn't change the PPL gamma signature, but it did reverse the panacell morphology. So maybe that's coming in lower down the process. This opens up a whole load of that opens up a whole load of things that we, I don't think we understand about um, the gene HG1601. But it may not just be an autophagy gene. It has obviously has other effects, and, and this may be one of those. Um, I put this data in because again, this was. Um, uh, I thought a very interesting um, observation. This is uh, work that was a, a collaboration between ourselves and, and Judy Cho, where we looked at um, exome chip. We were trying to identify genetic variants that were rare that had a big effect, and we didn't find those. Um, but we did identify a, a new gene for Crohn's disease, which is this epithelial zinc transporter. And again, going back to the seminal paper, this is associated with small bowel disease and stricturing phenotype. But I think the interesting thing here is that this was not associated with ulcerative colitis, but was associated with metabolic diseases um, and also schizophrenia. So metabolic diseases definitely and questionably schizophrenia, definitely IBD, have been associated with uh, changes in the microbiome. So we were interested in microbiome changes associated with this polymorphism. And what we found is there are microbiome changes. So if you're, if you're a healthy individual and you carry this variant, it shifts your microbiome in a direction that's more like Crohn's disease. So it sort of gardens your microbiome in a sort of pro-Crohn's disease type um, uh, phenotype. But also, if you're a healthy carrier and you're lean, you have a microbiome shift that's more in an in a obesity type microbiome. And there's significant overlap in some of the signature that we're seeing from the microbiome for Crohn's disease as for uh, metabolic diseases. And so one of, the, one of the other things that's come out of at least these two studies is potentially this overlap between uh, Crohn's disease susceptibility and uh, metabolic diseases, um, which I think, uh, given the whole role of fat in Crohn's disease and so on, is, is, is very, very interesting. So medical treatment was purely palliative and supportive. And everyone should have surgery. Um, and I understand most of the surgeons have gone after this morning's <laughs> things. So um, uh, that's probably a good thing. Otherwise, we'd never hear the end of it. But there um, is one left. Oh, OK. <laughs> They'll never see it. Yeah, OK. <laughs> yeah. Um, but actually, just think about medical treatment. Uh, is, there, is there anything to the paper you know, related to our modern medical therapy? Um, this is very controversial, but um, Marcus Neurath has suggested that vedolizumab may not be effective in small bowel disease because there may be a different mechanism in terms of homing of white cells to small bowel disease. And so, again, if you go back to the original paper, if you think it purely about small bowel disease, maybe vedolizumab isn't the most effective drug in that situation. We have to wait and see. The trial data doesn't necessarily suggest that, but um, certainly there's a, there's a, there's a feeling that this um, may not be the best drug for small bowel disease. We also looked at this slightly in a different way, and we identified that patients with Crohn's disease who basically had a colonic phenotype were, were, had a poorer response to anti-TNF therapies. This is a retrospective study and so on, and so it comes with all of those caveats. But you can see here smoking, colonic disease, monotherapy were all independently associated with primary non-response in Crohn's disease. And I'll just put this thing at the bottom here. This primary non-response in ulcerative colitis was less likely with a higher CD-specific PRS. There are about three negatives in that statement. And the, and the idea here is that if you have ulcerative colitis, 
but your gene signature looks more like Crohn's disease, you're more likely to respond to an anti-TNF. Um, and we're seeing some very other interesting things with these polygenic risk scores. And I think the polygenic risk scores are not far from coming to the clinic, not necessarily first in IBD, but the cardiologists are all over this, sort of adding them to um, uh, lipid profiles and so on in terms of identifying uh, people's risk factors for, for things like coronary artery disease and so on. I like these two statements a lot. And first of all, you've got... I, one day I'm going to write a paper that says hodgepodge in it. It's just <laughs> brilliant. Yeah. Um, but the idea is that there's all sorts of things going on here. And they were trying to pull out um, regional ileitis from a whole host of weird granulomatous type conditions and so on. And they actually um, drew the analogy with um, typhus and then said, look, under typhus, there's all these different infectious diseases, and one by one, we're sort of beginning to discover about them and pull them, pull them out of that. And I think we need to do some similar thing or a similar approach with inflammatory bowel disease. At the moment, we've got this incredibly heterogeneous condition. Even from a clinical perspective, add in molecular signatures and so on, and I've just put some of the clinical uh, ways about thinking about it, but we need to identify more homogenous groups and break this down, which is exactly what they did in the paper. And, um, you know, and it's, we're not alone in the immune-mediated diseases thinking about this. In a way, you can start to think about these diseases almost agnostically to what the end organ damage is and start to think about the molecular uh, underpinnings of this. And so there may be people with spondyl arthropathy were much closer to Crohn's disease than other patients with Crohn's disease, uh, and so on, almost, a, almost in an oncology way. And then if you start to do that, you can start to think potentially, if we're able to, from insurance companies and other things going on, to put you know, our current therapies and our therapies in the pipeline under these different phenotypes. But also, if you identify the molecular signature, this is where you start to be able to identify new therapies they're particularly relevant to that, including repurposing drugs that I showed you with the PPR gamma story. So, right at the you, you mentioned in the paper that right um, that the first time it was presented was actually at the AMA at the GI part of it, and I, it's fascinating to read some of the discussion that went on afterwards. So, uh, Dr. Bargan from uh, Rochester, presumably from the Mayo Clinic, um, said this is an important disease. That's great. Um, and that he, he believes the lesion is infectious, he may prove to be right, he may not. Uh, we haven't discovered the infection, but it will be discovered earlier and more frequently in the future. So, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, Dr. Friedenwald from Baltimore said it's a very, very important disease um, and uh, described quite nicely, you know, severe forms and also mild forms. And people were coming out of the discussion with their own new cases of inflammatory, uh, well, of Crohn's, uh, what we call Crohn's disease. I thought this was very interesting uh, from this doctor from Detroit, who basically had had a patient who'd had ulcerative colitis since the age of nine, and the disease had got worse, and so much worse that the, that the, um, the patient went on to have surgery, and at surgery, they discovered this uh, 30 centimeters of large, doughy, thickened ileum. And so we still have this problem. All of these patients that we diagnose with UC who end up having Crohn's disease, and this is an area that we really need to do a lot of work on. Um, so unfortunately, we have, haven't been able to really resolve Dr. Hirschman's uh, problem here. So, you know, this is a seminal paper um, and prophetic in many, many ways. And I, you know, I still think there are real lessons to be learned, and I think it should be required reading for all trainees. I, I can't emphasize how amazing the clinical description of the disease is. And every time I read it, I, I, I sort of learn something new. I think we're making progress in understanding these molecular causes under these different manifestations. Um, I would really strongly argue that technological advances are not being matched with the way that we think about the disease clinically from a phenotype perspective. And we need to do more work incorporating radiology, pathology, quantitative traits, and so on uh, in, into the way that we, we think about that. The, the, these pleiotropic phenomena, whether it's susceptibility or thinking about um, prognosis, 
are, are really prevalent. And we originally thought just with the immune mediated diseases and also some of the infectious diseases, but now we're seeing with metabolic diseases and with that paper that I showed you, Parkinson's disease uh, and, and so on. And so um, finally, um, right at the end of that discussion afterwards, Burrell Crone uh, said this, um, and I've uh, edited it slightly, uh, which is a change obviously over the years, but it, 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 it's been a real privilege uh, to, to give this lecture today. So thank you very much for the, um, for the invite. And I, I should just acknowledge, and as I was thinking about my acknowledgements last night, like any geneticist, I'm incredibly promiscuous with the people that I associate with from a research perspective. But, you know, I have incredible collaborations here at Mount Sinai and, and um, long may they continue. And finally, just going back to the title of my talk. So this is a book that um, if you were educated in the UK was required reading. 1066 and all that. So 1066, as anyone who grew up in England was told repeatedly, was the last time England was successfully invaded. And um, uh, I'm glad that John Fred isn't here to give me some grief about that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it was a seminal point in, in British history and, and sort of everything has followed from that. And, and this is what I believe about that paper. It's such an amazing <laughs> paper and it still poses many questions for us. So thank you very much. It was so great how you wove the paper through to modern times. The, the only flaw was ending on quoting Burl Crone when it's not my favorite <laughs> record. That's I know. okay. I know. Well, I think it goes back to what you said, because at the meeting, he was the only one who was, who, who was, um, who was uh, from Mount Sinai who actually was... Uh, transcribed as speaking, so, yeah. We can tell you much more later. Yeah, I'm sure. Have you looked at the genome of the chefs and other dancers? Yeah. Um, so one of my colleagues at Oxford did um, his uh, thesis, and part of his thesis on looking at Bechet's, and um, found some of the some HLA associations, but the HLA associations were, were, were different from the ones that we see in Crohn's disease, um, which is interesting. The, the problem is that... Um, where Bechet's is described in larger populations, like Turkey and then across the old Silk Route and so on, there are different HLA associations there anyway. Now, I, I have the uh, good fortune of working with some groups in uh, Korea, and one of the things that we're trying to do is start to look at some of the manifestations in Bechet's which could be confused with Crohn's disease, particularly the ones who have the colonic you know, lesions and so on, to start to see if we can see some some associations there. Henry always puts it the same. May I ask one other question? Sure, you can. Uh, and you may. At a clinical level. Yeah. I know anecdotes are not data, mm -hmm. but the subgroup of people with ulcerative colitis, they develop ulcerative colitis and they stop seven. Yeah. And they report another subgroup that they get better. Yeah. Uh, and I think there's one paper from Ireland, clinical paper actually, where they showed benefits. Yeah. Of course, nicotine works well. You know, nicotine studies in Belgium that work. Is, how does that relate to the pan of cell issues? Yeah, it's very interesting. In the pan of cells, um, you know, the pan in the pan of cell work that we did, when you smoke the mice, the ones who oh, I better get this right. When the ones who didn't carry the polymorphism, their colitis got worse. Um, so, so that's very interesting. Now, mice are not men, and, and vice versa. I think the whole smoking thing is just fascinating, and we don't understand it. The late onset disease people um, were much le more who developed Crohn's disease and had colonic disease were much more likely to be ex-smokers than the people who developed disease in what we call middle age. Um, and so again, it may come down to to phenotypes within Crohn's disease. It may be that colonic disease, colonic Crohn's disease from a smoking perspective, behaves a little bit more like ulcerative colitis. But I think there's real opportunities there. The one other thing I didn't mention in the mouse study is that we, we um, shouldn't use the word poisoned, we exposed the mice to nicotine, and nicotine did not have the same effect as smoking. So it wasn't, it wasn't nicotine, uh, as far as we could see, that was driving the symptoms. Yeah. Well, while we're talking about the panel cells, though, what is it 
functionally that is different about these cells as opposed to just microscopically they, they look different. Um, so that so they produce um, people have shown that they produce um, altered levels of well it's lysozyme that you're staining so it's lysozyme and then the defensins and people have shown that, that there are changes in the defense and production. Um, other studies have shown that the panacell morphology is uh, associated with differences in the microbiome. Microbiome was not driving what we saw with, with the mice here. Um, so antibiotics didn't have an effect and so on. So as far as we could see, there was, there was nothing there from, from a microbiome perspective. I actually want to follow up that slightly, but mm -hmm. uh, because the conventional wisdom about smoking being protective and aggravating <clears throat> may indeed break down and separate small bowel from colonic mm -hmm. disease. And I recall one study, a small study uh, from a few decades ago that actually suggested that smoking could be as protective in Crohn's disease and in colon yeah. as it was in ulcerative colitis. And you alluded to that yeah. in uh, one or two of your slides. Is there anything more on that from kind of clinical epidemiology in terms of no, Splitting. no, you know, and and one of the problems is that when we try and do smoking research in California, we can't find anyone who smokes. <laughs> they just don't smoke anymore. Now the problem, now now it raises an interesting question because do, do they, do, you know, what are the effects of marijuana? Um, and I don't know the answer to that um, because, well. When we started to try and think about marijuana, no one would admit to <coughs> taking a marijuana. Now it's legal in California. I think everyone takes marijuana, as far as I can work well, out. So, not yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, I think again, I, this is a real because it's the, the the environmental risk factor that we can best quantify, um, and with strong associations and those diverse things. I think it's an area that someone really should be on top of. Yeah. Second to last question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, Dermot, you know, I, I live in the world of cancer a little bit more than I see. And, you know, I think the whole field of cancer research is working with pathways, right? Yeah. So, with Lynch syndrome, for example, um, you know, it's, it's DNA mismatching. So, it's pathways, right? There's, you can even refer to RASopathies. Yeah. Cancer is due to RAS mutation. Right. As opposed to the organs. Yeah. Right? Like, why do you get GYN and colon cancers in Lynch. Yeah. Because those pathways are active in those. They just happen to be in those organs. Yeah. And you're looking at organ specific, but phenotypes as well. Yeah. Real um, your new, uh, newly developing uh, risk score. Uh, yeah, the polygenic risk score. Based on genes, right? Yeah. How closely can you predict the immunological pathways uh. that are emanating from those genes? I, it seems to me like the 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 risk and the pathogenesis is really going to be the pathways more than the genes. Yeah, yeah. It, it's. I think it's a very, very good point. I think our polygenic risk scores are still a blunt tool. Um, what we've done is we've we've modified them beyond what I showed you today. Basically, we've modified them in a couple of ways. We've taken CD only risk because here you're taking the ones that are also associated with UC, and you see more extreme. But the other way that we've done it is we've gone back to try and understand the biology and we've created pathway specific polygenic risk scores. And so we've got polygenic risk scores which are associated with epithelial defects, for example, things associated with autophagy. And that's a brilliant way to do biology because then you can you take all of your patients with Crohn's disease, you want to have the ones with the high autophagy score and the low autophagy score, and then you get samples from those individuals and you can really start to try and understand how these things with modest effect on their own, but once you stack them up, may, may start to have um, those effects. It's more commonly connected to the gene expression, the risk actually, but they seem to establish that. Although we have a gene risk score, that didn't show predictive prognosis of the risk score, the transcriptional risk score. Yeah. And red, actually, it had more power to yeah, I, I took that slide out. I apologize. No. But actually, what was really interesting about that study is that the transcriptional risk score came from where they'd identified EQTLs in blood. So again, it's sort of a peripheral signature that may be informing a gut signature, which would be incredibly useful for us. I just want to comment about Marcus's theory about alpha You know, when we were visiting Pisac, 
Yeah. Their small bowel disease could have almost 100% of the time. These are patients who had who used it because we were desperate. Yeah. And a lot of you know very severe small bowel disease, mm. and even using double blue, completely normal and they said the needle came yeah. out, mm. and their small bowel disease came back. Yeah. Almost that's, invariably. That's so interesting. That aspect of acetylcholine and wine, I yeah. I know we didn't see it as much. There was a power difference as a patient in general. Yeah. You know, so, but I think there's a biology difference. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Very well, with that, we're going to end. <laughs> <laughs>